We're recording? We're recording. That's okay. good. At least we're recording. Confirmed we're Confirmed recording. Confirmed we're recording. <laughs> Ready when you are. Well, hello, and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Robert Kaplan. Today, I'm with my friend and a fantastic documentary photographer, Nancy Borowick. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm, well, I'm thrilled that you're here now, especially because now you live in Guam. Yes. So you're quite far <laughs> from New York. You used to be, you know, running around the streets here and we'd see each other at events here and there. Yeah. And now it's now you're in town because you have a new book out. I'm going to show this book off. A new. Well, it's also my first book. Your first book and a new book, The Family Imprint, A Daughter's Portrait of Love and Loss. Yes. About your family, your mother and father who recently passed away. Um, and it's a, a beautiful, uh, like it is, a, it's, it's just a beautiful uh, tribute to them. I just, you know, went through it thoroughly the last, you know, this morning, finally. I've been peeking, I've been out of town in Barcelona and everything, and I haven't yeah. been able to, like, look at the whole book project. Of course, I've seen it online over the years. Yeah. Well, anyhow, before we get started and before okay. we jump into your into your book, I just want to say thanks again. Thanks, as always, to Adorama and the use of their event space to record our podcasts. Um, also, thank you to uh, Canon Professional Services and Temba Bags for all of your support. Uh, and to please make sure uh, if you're watching now on Facebook, hit the little button that says to be notified next time we go live. So you see these podcasts and events. We're always doing great podcasts with different photographers and, and so on. So. Um, with no further ado, let's get back to you. Okay. Um, Am I holding this? Am I good? You're good. You just, <laughs> you just talk over the microphone. <laughs> so um, I'm going to, as we talk, I'm just going to start going through some of your photos okay. um, from this book and this project. Okay. Um, and I'd, what I'd love for you to do is maybe give me a little bit of background about um, how the project started. Okay. Um, and we'll just go through, through the photos. If you see any photos you want to talk about, stop me. Okay. 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 All okay. right. Tell me about it. So the project, well, um, so initially it was a story of my parents who were both in treatment for cancer at the same time. My mother had breast cancer, my father had pancreatic cancer, and I was just sort of going through the motions of photographing them because I didn't really know how to spend time with them without, you know, like completely falling apart. And I spend my days with a camera in front of my face, so it made sense to continue that, you know, <laughs> that was how I see the world. And I just wanted to spend more time with them. And I realized pretty quickly that the story, if I was to call it a story, the story that I was photographing and the story that we were living was not so much about cancer and dying. It was about living, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like in contrast. Mm -hmm. So I just, I told, I wanted to tell the story of how we were living mm -hmm. and, and just be with them. Um, I never planned on ever sharing the work. I was just doing it for me. I didn't think about it like, you know, the work. Yeah. But... It was my processing of what was happening. And um, it was a journey, you know, I, as a photographer, some people would say, you know, you have such great access, these are your parents. And I'm like, yes, great access, but these are my parents. You know, I'm grappling with this, you know, them being vulnerable and open in front of me and, and then deciding how to document them and tell their story and hoping that I'm doing it right and hoping that I'm, I'm not upsetting them in any way. and. Um, but they were really open to allowing me to photograph them. When, when did this, um, I, you know, it's, that's a hard thing to ask anybody to photograph is, is yeah. you know, the end of their life, essentially. Yeah. And um, I know that maybe, you know, my family, some, you know, my mother would, you know, would be very difficult, I think, to, to get her to let me just take any, any photos of her nonstop. Yeah. Um, was it difficult kind of asking their permission or was it just, do you always, had you always been photographing them? It was it just second nature? Well, so my mother had been, she had her first, this was her, thir her third diagnosis with breast cancer. So when she had been, when she had had her first recurrence, I was a student at the International Center of Photography and I wanted... You know, I, I basically said I, I want to photograph her so I could be home and spend time with her while I'm a student. Um, and she was very open for, open to it because the first time she was diagnosed, she was she was scared. But mm -hmm. when it came back, she was angry. And I think she was, that made her very open. She was very open to the idea of sharing and telling her story um, if it could help anyone in the process. And so when, when my father was diagnosed and my mother was already in treatment for the third time, mm -hmm. he actually approached my mother and said, do you think Nancy would photograph me? And I look at that and think, you know what, I feel like they wanted to, they wanted to share their story. Um, I don't know, maybe there's this feeling of 
you know, like wondering if you're going to be forgotten or, or just wanting to make sure that you get to say the things you want to say. Yeah. And I wanted to support them in that. And so I, you know, I photographed them, I recorded them, we did interviews, um, just, you know, and just had long conversations over cups of hot chocolate, just kind of. A wonderful thing to do just for your own, you know, personal, like talking to them, hearing all of these stories, reading your book. I felt like, you know, I knew them so well, you know, all, all of the. The stories. There were some photos of, of them of the, of your mother going through jewelry with you. Mm-hmm. You're talking about how uh, she would, you know, talk about these different stories, worrying about them yeah. being lost with her. And now, and now you know the stories behind it, which is amazing. Just being able to get that. Yeah, and you know, you hear these stories your entire life. And I feel like as a kid, I used to roll my eyes and be like, I've heard this one before. And but I don't even think I don't think I really held on to it. And now suddenly, with this awareness of time this awareness that we didn't know how much time we had left, I became obsessive about recording. You Mm -hmm. know, I was like, I have to document everything. I have to, I'm holding on to as much as I can, the best that I can. And I've actually, some students have said, like uh, these Teen Academy students had said to me, you know, why do you want to remember this time in your life? Why do you want to remember your parents dying? And I thought that was really poignant. And I, but I said to them, you know, to me, I, when I look back at these photographs, I remember... I remember courage and I remember strength and I remember perseverance and and I feel like I can look at a family photo that's us smiling, you know, like on vacation or something and I remember that and I love that, but I don't I can't feel their essence. And so by by you know, by trying to tell their story with my camera the way that I would any other story, I think it kind of um I I, I like the full story. I want the full story. Right, <laughs> right. I want to stop on this photo yes. because um, it's an interesting time. You had been doing this documentary on your on your parents at this point uh, for quite some time. Yeah. And I don't think the the book was you didn't think about doing the book no. until after everything. Right. So, um, but you ended up photographing your own wedding, right? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, I'm a photographer. <laughs> it's so it's so impossible to relinquish that control. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and actually, this photograph I love because. It's, I feel like photographers appreciate like the hilarity of it. So um, we ultimately decided, I, you know, my friends and family who were going to help me to rig a camera in the tree above the huppa. Uh-huh. And my plan was to trigger the remote on, on that camera by putting the trigger in my bouquet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was I'd al- wondering about I'd that. I'd also thought, I mean, like first, first I thought I bought a GoPro and I was like, yeah, that's maybe a little excessive. Um, so, so I was about to walk down the aisle and I, I was going to, you know, trigger it and it, I, you know, I was in control uh-huh. <laughs> and I decided that maybe in this one moment in my life, I could be present. <laughs> yeah. uh, it would be my gift to yeah, my husband. Yeah. So ultimately I, I gave it to uh, a friend of mine who triggered it for me. Oh. And so this was, you know, part luck and I'm but you s- climbed up in the tree and you, you put oh, it yes. in there yourself. Oh yeah. Actually, if you flip to the next one real quick. Oh, yeah. I threw that in there. It's uh. kind of a low res. My brother took this on his phone, but uh, there I am in the tree. Nice. Setting it up. <laughs> in, your we- you in your wedding gown in well, that Well, not. it was like my pre-wedding gown. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, just because I didn't want to risk ruining it in the tree. <laughs> <laughs> so wonderful. So wonderful. Um, so I also want to talk about, um, you know, the process of editing all of these photos. Uh, the, the f- was it the foreword was by James Estrin, who you know, has, I know, I think the first place I probably saw these photos was the Lens blog. Yes. um, And has since, you know, been in the New York Times a number of times and the Lens blog continuously and and so on. Um, How do you go through the process? I mean, you sent me just, just now, you sent me a bunch of photos that were like all edits and there's more photos in the book and they're all wonderful. Yeah. But, but I can't imagine how many photos you took and how you decided to go with the ones you did. Can you give me a little bit of an idea of what that process is like, especially when you're going through photos that are so sentimental to you yeah so it you know it wasn't as challenging as one might think because I was sharing the story as it was happening Um, the lens blog and the New York Times ran the story in print and online and then and so it kind of unfolded in chapters because then I reapproached them and I said I know this is crazy but can we do another piece after my father died and Mm -hmm. they agreed and Mm -hmm. then I reapproached them again for another chapter my mother had died Mm -hmm. and they said okay and then I approached them a fourth time um, when I was doing the Kickstarter for the book and um, they agreed that last time because I felt like I needed to tell I needed to tell the whole story and because life 
happen. You know, like sometimes I feel like at the end of a story, at the end of a photo essay, you don't you wonder what happened following that. And um, and now I've completely lost track of what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, it's it's difficult. Oh, the edit. The edit. Yes, the the edit. Right. So, I, you know. As, as I was shooting, I was doing my normal processing for, for my, as though I was on an assignment because I knew it would be overwhelming if I didn't do it immediately. Yeah. I also wanted to make sure I was captioning because I worried that I would forget yeah. some of the things that were happening. And, and it so was, so it was my, yeah. it became my journal. I referenced those captions. I referenced the chronology in those photographs to give me a help my mem, you know, help my memory a little bit. Um, so when the time, it came time to decide what was going to go in the book, what's so amazing about a book is you kind of get to include more than that standard 12 images that you might see on a web gallery yeah. um, or the, you know, the, the one or two images you'll see in print. I got to include, you know, a hundred, I forget now, it was like a hundred and something black and white images and then color images. I got... I had the freedom to tell the story how I wanted to tell it. Well, there was something else that really surprised me about this book. When I when I was playing with it, I got to a page here. Yes. I don't know. These cards that are in here, and you can open them, and it's like they're the actual cards that your parents sent each so other. So the very first copy of this book I gave to someone, they handed back to me. They thought it was my personal copy. My wife um, said, my wife said, are those copies? I'm like, no, they're the real cards in my book. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, it's just, you know, amazing, you know, what you can do and, and the quality, I should also mention, uh, the, 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 the photos, they almost have a feel to them, which is different than a lot of photo books. That yeah, I think, well, I worked with Hatshe Kanz in Germany and they, they were a great publisher because they were open to all of my crazy ideas. And actually it wasn't until I approached them with the Kickstarter backing saying, I want to, I think you're a good partner, but I also have a wish list. I want to do, I want to have a needlepoint on the cover that my father made for my mother. I want to include some of the greeting cards that they wrote to each other because I wanted to tell, you know, that the cancer was just a piece of the story. It was one small chapter. It, they were so much more than that. So I, I wanted to, I wanted it to be tactile. I wanted you to feel them and know them. And in some ways feel, I feel, even when I open the cards, I feel a little bit of that like voyeuristic, like I don't know if I should be looking, but I want to look. Mm -hmm. And I'm inviting you into our intimate space. So yeah. I've been an open book, you know, like literally, literally, literally. Uh, my entire life. And, and, and also some of these pages are like literal copies of, of your own photo albums, family photo yes. albums, you and your brother and sister and family yeah. on vacation, them getting married. Yeah. I wanted to pay tribute to our family and, and, and memory and family in general and our, our old albums, all the pictures that the corners cut yeah. uh, and they're just packed in and I love that. It just reminds me of the life that we lived and, and the love that we shared. Right. Um, so we were going through and talking about other things, but I want to talk about, you maybe start, start here. Okay. Um, you know, as this progressed along, you, you know, we got to the end of your father's life. Yeah. Yeah. And this photo is actually a, of you, a, a photo your mother took. Mm -hmm. uh, you were just actually having a moment to yourself. Yeah. Or? Well, actually, so, some people ask if there was ever a moment when I put my camera down uh -huh. and I'm like, you know, I never really put it down. There was never something I saw that I thought, Oh, I can't photograph this. I mm -hmm. wasn't, I was just going through the motions. But in this circumstance, my father was having, um, a, an IV put in his arm and I'm watching the nurse struggle to find a vein. Oh, yeah. And I thought to myself, well, I've taken so many pictures of this moment. If I take more, I'm just going to have to edit through, like, right. I'm just going to put my camera down and I put it down and I'm watching her and, and then the next thing I know, I'm being led into the room next door and put on a bed. I think I had begun to faint. Oh. And I thought, well, what, you know, like, what just happened? Yeah. I've been in this hospital, like, for months on end. Like, why now? Yeah. And then I realized my camera has literally been in front of my face this entire time. And it has been providing me that distance, but allowing me to be close. Yeah. That's another thing I wanted to talk about was was it's almost a, a coping mechanism. I yeah. mean, you can sort of hide behind it a bit and, and look look at it through your lens rather than. And I, I feel that on different assignments that I'm on shooting different things. Yeah. You know, if they're hard issues or whatever, you can you, you're not you're almost not there or you're behind the camera. Well, it's just amazing how how you're able to kind of trick yourself in that way, because I am obviously this is my reality. I'm experiencing it in real time, but I was able to put on my photographer's hat and, you know, think like I'm on, on an assignment and just kind of switch. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until this happened that I realized just how important and valuable this, that camera was to my gr my grief, but also my my ability to 
to be there and get through it because if I was falling apart, like, I don't know. I, yeah. I wanted to be strong for them. And this, and also I think that the camera let me, it was a, it's a language that I'm familiar with. So I could look at the situation and utilize that yeah, in that way. Absolutely. So um, as we, you know, get to some really difficult times to take photos, you know, uh, can you give me an idea? I mean, w did you use your camera? Were you, you know, I don't, I don't know how you would be in a situation like that as a daughter, you know, being there as a family member with the rest of your family, yet still wanting to document this. And, you know, h how was this time for you? It was strange. I had not been in this situation quite like this before. I feel like, you know, camera slung over my shoulder. There were like moments, I don't know, there were moments that I would see and I would immediately pick up my camera and take and snap a photo. And then the next moment, you know, like help my mom as she's helping my dad, right. like take a spoonful of food. Like right. it just, it wasn't very, it these wasn't are all very, split seconds. It's all split seconds. And right. it wasn't like, I was never thinking rationally during this time. I was just kind of living in the moment. And mm -hmm. if, and you know, photography in so many ways is instinctual. You feel something, you see something, you shoot it. Yeah. And like, you don't really think, I mean, at least I, maybe, maybe from being an assignment shooter, I just, I learned how right. to kind of think quickly and react quickly. Sure. Now, and then obviously your family knew what you were doing as well. That, yes. I believe this is, this is actually your mother's funeral. No, yeah. father's. Oh, this, oh, th I'm sorry. That's there your father. My mother. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Excuse me. There was two side by side well, that I saw earlier. they look very similar. And, they, and you have two photos that are, you know, basically identical to yeah. this. Um, and, um, you know, what, what was the rest of your family's reaction? Was it strange for them to see you taking pictures or was it just uh, the normal, the norm? It wasn't, it wasn't either of those. It was sort of in between. A lot of people, I think because my parents were okay with it and I, and we, you know, we published that first piece and suddenly my relatives were seeing a whole other side of the story. And I think because my parents were okay with it, they seemed okay with it. One thing that I've come to realize is that I didn't, for, for, a, long, for a long time, I kind of forgot that this story wasn't just mine. Mm -hmm. Like that I have like siblings and yeah. that this, this is their story too. And they're yeah. living this too. And, and I've, I try now to make an effort to express that this is our story. And, but this is the, this is through my lens, yeah. the experience that we had, cause we all experienced it differently. Um, I think everyone is just, I'm, I'm also protective. We're all protective of them. But at the same time, we saw that they were, once the story first was published and so many people came out of the woodwork to share with us, um, I kind of gave their lives and their deaths this greater meaning and purpose. The fact that it could help so many people just by being open and sharing. Yeah. Can you give, tell me a little bit about your, your mother's to-do list? That's yes, a big... I'm so glad you stopped on this one. A big trend in your book. Yes. So, I mean, that's it's in our DNA. Scrapbooking and to-do lists, mm -hmm. I think, are in the Borg DNA. And my mother... What I loved about this picture and this moment was that this, to me, spoke to living. You know, my father had just died and my mom, you know, made her to-do list and it had everything on there, I feel like, weighed equally on her to-do list. It all made it onto the same list. It's mm -hmm. like order Howie's headstone, um, work on bills, decide regarding radiation, like where are the Girl Scout cookies? Like, yeah. They all were <laughs> equal, of equal yeah. importance to her and to me that was living. Uh -huh. You know, she w cancer was just another thing on her list. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And then I get to see her handwriting, which I don't know if you relate to this, but I see handwriting and I immediately relate or remember, or I feel this sense of familiarity. Like, mm -hmm. I'll always know my mother's handwriting. There was something really amazing about your father's handwriting too. It's yes. like each of, I, I don't know if there'll be another photo of that coming up, but uh, all it's like even the, the lines below, it's like his, his letters go right in between the lines from the Y's above. I, yeah, he was very it, methodical. Like, yeah, and he often, he, he often wrote in capital letters and he would send emails in capital letters and we tried to explain that he was yelling course, at everybody yeah. and it just never <laughs> translated. <laughs> goodness um so what ended up happening was your your father passed away and your your mother ended up living for another almost exact year yeah beyond so there were a lot of strange coincidences that I, I guess part of me always felt like okay the universe works in strange ways and maybe there's a reason for this but my father died december 7th 2013 mm -hmm. my mother died december 6th 2014 and it just it was so unbelievable and but but comforting in the same at the right. same time it's like okay they were in this together and now they're they've got, they're gone together and um 
I don't know. Yeah, There's, it's it's it's, it's something. hard to it's something. It's yeah. one of those things where I I you know the wind the the wind will blow and I will you know like I'll feel like there's something else. like I everything has new meaning now because I feel like I don't know there's something yeah. bigger than me yeah this was the photo I was referencing earlier yes. about you guys going through jewelry and whatnot yeah and once what what's interesting to me about this is um, what I learned there were so many stories that my mother told us this day you know mm-hmm. like about this pair of earrings that belonged to my great grandmother and then this bracelet that she bought last week. And th- the reason why I point those two out is I wouldn't have known the difference necessarily if she hadn't told me. And that was representative of what was happening. We were, we lost our father. We were losing our mother. And we were losing the stories. Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually the book opens with a key. And it has no markings. Um, it, I don't know what it belongs to. I have no idea what it opens. It's not something, yeah. And you know what? Uh, part of, I think, this process is accepting that. Yeah. Accepting that I won't have all the answers. Yeah. And that's part of loss and that's part of moving on. Um, so I just encourage people to have those conversations and talk and share and not be fearful as my mom would share, you know, tell me because once they're gone, they're gone. And and so beyond this, this book being a testament to your family, yeah. do you feel like it, I mean, everyone has been touched in some way by cancer and by someone they know or, or loss or, or illness, loss or, or, illness or, or so on. Yeah. So many people can relate in different capacities to, to this. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I mean, is it meant to, to help others than, you know, just your family, just your, yeah. You know, I, my thought at the beginning was I wanted to create this book as, as a place for me to hold on to all of these memories. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I interviewed my parents, I recorded lots of conversations and um, had them transcribed. And uh, that's a lot of the text in the book. Um, I wanted to hold on to it for me so I can reference it in time. And having seen how people were had, you know, expressed their gratitude for my openness and sharing of the story and how maybe it helped them in the process of whatever they were going through, it kind of gave it felt almost like a responsibility. Like I, they, my parents shared this with me. I want to continue to share it if it can help other people. It's given me a greater purpose, mm-hmm. which is, it's pretty amazing when you feel like your photographs can make a difference in someone's life. I know that seems like kind of simple. That's what we do. We're storytellers, documentary photographers, photojournalists. We, we hope that our photographs inform people and, and guide people. And I don't know. And I, so to feel like that, I can I could do that with these images and with the old images and the book, you know. Like I guess I hope the book is a I hope the book is a tool for people to find comfort in whatever they're going through, find community, maybe find inspiration. It maybe as a reminder that life is short. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't have to move to Guam, but <laughs> like you know, to not lose sight of that perspective. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about Guam in a little bit. Okay. We gotta we gotta we gotta talk about Guam, Guam okay. but we okay. want to make sure we get through all of your yes. photos here. Um, and then, you know, going back and, and packing up the house and finding all of it. So the book doesn't just end when, when they both are gone. No. It, it continues on a bit. It does. Um, because life continues. Yes. And this is what happens. Uh, and so actually cleaning out the house, I was warned it was going to be a terrifying experience. It was going to be <laughs> difficult and emotional. And you know what? It was difficult and emotional. But it was also amazing. It was like a treasure hunt. We uncovered things deep buried in our house um, that told the story of who our family was and and kind of informed who I think I am today. Like things about my parents, those letters that my mother saved, um, post-it notes with random pieces of advice. Yeah. Uh, old photos, <laughs> one million old photos, old VHS tapes, which oh, yeah. I recently got digitized. And I strongly advise anybody listening, if you have a VHS tape, please don't delay because mine were, mine were starting to disintegrate. Oh yeah, some of them won't even play. Like, I know. They just won't even, there's some mechanism issue. And you. It, and once they're gone, they're gone. Yeah. I just okay. recently had mine I hope you're listening. Well. You did. I did. Good. They're really, it's so much fun to oh, unearth I know. these things. It's, so. And it's also then, it's like a very deep dark hole because you're like, all you want to do is watch these old videos and send them to people. And Christmas 1987 uh, was, was so it for good. me. That was like, I used to watch that tape all along. Yeah. Um, and then, so... You got a lot of play in the New York Times, um, and well, and so I included this because I wanted to show this was very generous. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven images, and and to, at first for me, I was like, oh, but there's so much. Like every picture in this project is important to me, you know, like for different reasons. But and but seven 
that's all we were given and that's a lot. Um, but this was the first spread that happened. I remember telling my parents it was going to be on the cover of the Metropolitan section and they were like, what? <laughs> oh my gosh. Totally. Oh my gosh. Um, and so we can go through a couple. Yeah, this actually. Was, so this was more. that four different times that they, four different times. Yeah. The fourth time was just, was only online, but beautiful work. Thank you. It was really special to get to honor. And you know what? It was really important that the work was in print too, because I felt like there could be a whole generation of people who might not come across it online, like my parents who mm -hmm. might have not necessarily seen it. And it's a generation of people who could re maybe relate to me more than, uh, than, than someone, you know, 31 years old like me. Yeah. With the exception of I met, I spoke to a girl, a complete stranger today who I got, we got an e I get a lot of these emails where people introduce us and it, she was like her her father had pancreatic cancer and her mother had a terminal illness and it was like we just got on the phone and immediately talked we we're like you know just started as though we knew each other for years it's mm -hmm. like just but it's so rare to find someone our you know our age having gone through the, this experience right um and and these are some of the photos that um uh, that are included but in in the actual book it's in album format so yes. it feels like you know a real i'm just going to breeze through yeah. that so you just can gotta get an idea i just threw in some highlights threw you in know. some <laughs> yes and she looks so much like you i know it's, <laughs> it's, it's i thought crazy. that was i thought that this was you really when we were going through when i was going through it at first amazing um that's her that's her in, in labor or about to go into labor with me <laughs> not tonight i have a i know and then nice. my father loved those little like <laughs> Caption bubble stickers. They're all, yeah, they're ridiculous. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> what a process. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the book process, you ended up doing a, was it Kickstarter you said? Mm -hmm. And that was that integral to making this happen? That like, was, in, that was completely integral into making, to making this happen because, you know, I did approach a couple of publishers who, um, Actually, if you go to the very bottom, oh. you can see one of the spreads that oh. we were talking about earlier. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if it shows up. There we go. That's one one of the spreads. Yeah, this is how it looked on the, <laughs> in the book. This is how our old albums look. And, and they really popped out in the in the book as well because everything else is in this, you know, black, black and, and white. white. And then you open up a page, it's like, boom, you know, you get hit yeah. with these, this sort of like... They kind of bring to life. Nostalgic feel mm -hmm. uh, of the times. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it wasn't... That was sort of intentional, but also, you know. Because the pictures go back to their wedding, which mm -hmm. I believe were color photos. Yes. So it was in, a, you know, vintage color. You know, like it, the, hit, the past was in color and the present was in black and white. But the present was in black and white because there was no, there was no color in my life in that time. Right. I didn't notice color. Right. Life was just kind of in this in-between. But to finish. Oh. No, no. Oh, but to finish what we were saying earlier about the Kickstarter. Um, I, I wanted to create this book and I understood that books are complicated and expensive and I'd met with a publisher before the Kickstarter who said you know nobody wants to buy a book about death and it shocked me because I was like this is so clearly not about death yeah it's about life yeah and then I decided you know what I need to do this myself you know publisher or no publisher and so I turned to crowdfunding and to the community and it was in, it was crazy yeah crazy it's it really is amazing and, and there's a lot of photographers doing it now and and it's exciting for me, because I'm, I'm thinking like this is the the way to get people to, to, to allow people to do put these pieces of art together in a book form that wouldn't be able to do this anyway. So it's yeah. like it's really fun. It's fun for me. It's nice. It feels good to to go yeah. ahead and buy a well, book, and then, pre-order. And, and my book, you owning one of my books makes you a part of my story too. Like this book exists because of the people who cared about it, and, like cared about our story or connected or related. And like that makes it even more special. And you've got it in bookstores. Yeah. Well, let's backtrack for a second. So <laughs> one woman show, I thought I could do everything. And uh -huh. then I realized I do not have publishing experience. So what I ultimately did was I approached a uh, published, I approached Hatchet Cons in Germany and I said, I would like to subsidize the cost of a print run. Um, but this is my wish list. Uh -huh. And I sold them on it and, uh, promised that I was going to, you know, put my heart and soul into getting the book out there and sharing it. Cause that's what was most important to me. Uh -huh. Um, and I, I still can't believe that that's why we have the cards. That's why we have a textured cover. I, this was actually kind of a tribute to my old family albums that had like a little gold um, tip in, you know, like the old wedding album. And it's something that it's an object. It's not your classic photography book. It's a scrapbook. Right. And, and pitching that around can be a little tricky because people don't really know where to put it but it's kind of in its own category. Uh, but through the, once I partnered with the publisher, they then had an American distributor, DAP, and 
they helped me with that part of the process because I had spoken to other photographers who self-published. Right. And I said, what are some of the challenges and what do you wish you had known then? And they said, distribution. Right. Like, cause they're, you know, one book at a time out of their house. And for me, I wanted, I wanted to get this book out and, and have it available, but also get back to shooting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we end talking about the book project, okay. I just want to say that, uh, you can buy this on Amazon. Yes, it's a little, it's a, a bit back ordered, but it is available. You can, nice. which is so you have to do another print run. Is that the deal? Not yet. The, it's because they, they sold all the books that they had coming in and then they had to get more from Germany. Oh, wow. So they're on a boat right now, but you can order it and it'll be there in like a week or two. You're rocking it. That is so <laughs> awesome. I mean, it's so hard to have uh, photography books are, I think are known for being the, the least selling yeah. books of them all, you know, just yeah. selling you know, very few copies. But. Well, part of it also, I like to think, is that with the Kickstarter money, the remainder of the money that I was actually going to put towards doing some events around the book, instead, I gave them the remainder of the money and I said, it is imperative to me that this book not cost what I know that you want to charge for it. Uh -huh. It was, you know, this book should have cost $60, $70. And uh -huh. I was like, I, I will feel comfortable with $40. Uh -huh. Because that's still expensive, but it's more affordable than your average art book. Sure, sure. And I want it to, because I want it to be accessible to people. And yeah. what's happened is that it's 40, but then suddenly it's on Amazon for 25. And that, that opens the door to so many more people who maybe wouldn't have considered an art book or a photo book. Right. Because the goal being, you know, when I started this, someone said, well, what is your goal? Is your goal notoriety? Is your goal to sell books? What is it? And I was like, my goal is to be able to share this story. Like, Plain and simple. Well, you've been extremely successful. And, and I should also say, you came, you're in town because you had all of these events surrounding the book launch. Yes. Right? Because it's like I left for Barcelona two weeks ago and you were here and you're still here. Yeah, now. no, I've been here for, I'll be here for a total of six weeks. Oh, wow. So so you had the book launch and then just the last couple of days you had an event. Um, I did a panel at ICP with James Estrin and Bonnie Bryant, yeah. uh, my designer. And and then I we had a party last night. Um, I spoke at my my alma mater, Union College. I spoke at my hometown library. Shout out to Chappaqua Library. Um, <laughs> You're just doing a full on uh, press tour on this. Yeah, I've, cr I've kind of created a mess for myself because I planned all of it myself. And uh -huh. my head, my mind said, this is a great idea. My, I feel like my body is like, slow down a little. <laughs> Maybe I need to get back to my island and your take island a of Guam. My so, island of Guam. So, okay, so everyone get the book at Amazon at or Amazon or Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble. Or, or your local independent bookstore. Yeah. There's still some at the Strand and support cool. local. Yeah. Um, and so I want to jump jump into um, the rest of your career. You know, we, we you know, give me a little background. So we're okay. going to go through some photos. Okay. And, and where were these photos taken? This, this some they're a little ro low resolution. They're yeah. Kind of, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I after college, <laughs> I graduated and thought, okay, I can do anything. I'm a college graduate. And, and then I was an intern and was like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I want to find purpose. You know, I was 22. And Where'd I, you intern? Uh, Glamour Magazine Glamour in magazine. their photo department. Nice. I was like, this is really interesting, but I want to be shooting. And I want to, like, I don't know. I just, I needed to, I needed to get out there. Right. So I uh, found an opportunity teaching photography in Ghana. And I moved there for two months and taught photography. And at the end of my trip, I said, is there something, if I could raise funds for something at the school, like what would you what would you want? And they said, a well would be great. And a I well, said, yeah. okay, idealistic, naive, whatever, I can do this. Um, I came back to New York and I did a very, I, I contacted a friend who had a connection to Envoy Gallery and I said, and I'm a no-name photographer, I'm like, could I put up a really quick show over the course of a weekend in between two of your shows? Mm -hmm. I'll put it up and take it down. And they said, okay. And so I, you know, I printed the pictures, I put them in these crazy mats and I hung them and I had an exhibition. I, you know, I had no idea what I was doing, but people showed up and I did about two more events like that. And very quickly, or, or not very quickly, but over the course of a year, I had raised about $11,000. Wow. People bought my photographs because they, they were impacted by the story and wanted to participate and help and change. And suddenly I realized, wow, like this is what I want to do for my life. Like I want to be able to like, what a cool, amazing thing to, uh, to, per, uh, to be a part of changing someone else's life and impacting them through my photographs. Like, wow, I, I just, <laughs> I don't, I don't have the words for it. Yeah. But, 
So actually, you're giving back, and that's, I mean, giving back is one of the most amazing things you can do, especially when it's through your craft and stuff. Yeah, and I, and I got so much from them. It was like, how can I repay these people for what they shared with me? Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, this is my little, so this is, I did before I left Ghana that first trip, um, I did a little makeshift exhibition in one of the classrooms. And the kids are like, you know, a lot of them did not have any photographs of their own um, or of themselves. So it was a cool experience. And even another thing that was interesting was many of them, you know, didn't have televisions or anything like that. And um, I realized that we we see our world so much. We see images so much in this frame. And one of the while I was teaching them, I noticed that like they weren't they weren't so restricted to the frame because. Mm -hmm that's not how they've seen their the world you right. know in the way that we might through right. televisions and, sure. and like screens and whatever sure it was really fun i was trying to teach them about perspective bird's eye worm's eye <laughs> 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 uh, and this is one of my students mommy k who i've kept in touch with she was kind of my star photographer oh yeah and she just she had a way about her she maybe she like reminded me of a young of a young me Aww. um and i've kept in touch because actually after this project the well project i connected with a few um, nonprofits. There's this one, the Touch of Life Foundation, that actually works with children who have been trafficked into slavery um, awful, on this lake. Yeah. Awful stuff. And I was out in Ghana, and I contacted them. and was like, I'd love to photograph your kids. And um, they said, okay. And then basically the last 10 years, they've been sending me back because I now know the children, and they know me. And that relationship has been so fulfilling and, and special and but every time I go back to Ghana with them, I go back to my village to see my kids. But they're growing up now. Is it? And they they remember you. They're like, well, hard to forget. Yeah. Know, well, actually, they put it. They, they put a giant plaque on the well that says like, oh gosh, this well is like made by Nancy Borowick and the oh Ghana on Top project. That is so exciting. Now, now the rest of these photos yes. that we're going to go through are, yeah. are, are like assignment work that you've done for various newspapers and magazines. You yeah. freelance. You freelance, like me, freelance for the New York Times. Yep. Who else? Uh, New York Times. Uh, anybody and everybody, right? Anybody and I, anybody and everybody. I think variety is the spice of life, mm-hmm. and every experience is another tool in your tool belt. So I love, like I, have, you know, do family shoots. I photograph dogs. Yeah. I, I they just I find joy. Anytime I get to be shooting, I mean, like, why? Well, it it brings me joy. Absolutely. So um, and, and so, just before we go through some of these photos, yeah. you had mentioned you you went through school, so. What's the what's the pro you you went to ICP yes. but that you went to a school before that you went, yeah I went okay. I went to undergraduate I went to Union okay. College where and I studied did, anthropology anthropology okay which led you to to Ghana yes okay and then you came out of that did yes. you intern first at Glamour no Glamour actually was between Glamour was between college and Ghana okay got I actually it. like had a very momentary blog called From Glamour to Ghana I thought I was so <laughs> clever um, and. I remember getting back from Ghana being like, how do I, how do I continue doing this? Like, this is what I love and care about. And like, it just becomes a part of who you are. You know, it's, I've also always been a storyteller when I was a kid. I've shared this before, so I apologize if you've heard it, but I was, my mom got a call one day from one of my teachers to let me know that I was the class tattletale. Oh, snap. I know. And, but I look at that, that now and I'm like, yeah, I was a storyteller. (laughs) I also cared a lot about justice. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, so and then so then I went to ICP, did their one year um, certificate program in photojournalism and doc. And how was that experience for you? It was great because I, I really needed to I felt like I needed to hone my skills. Okay. I loved photography. I was eager to get out there and tell stories, but I felt like I was missing certain skill sets. And also like to be in an environment surrounded by other people learning and growing and, and learning how to edit and learning how to sequence and learning how to dig into a story and um I don't know. I, it made me realize how, how much I had still needed to learn and grow. And that environment was great. And also, it's nice to have a community. You know, it was like a built-in community of photographers from around the world and amazing teachers and editors. And um, I'm really grateful for what I experienced there. But also, I, it really just, it, it taught me about, I guess, being more, like, learn, I learned how to be, become a professional photographer. And I learned, I got access to certain things and people that I never would have gotten access to and got to show my work to editors. Yeah. You know, when I had no business and showing and work. And you're in New York City and yeah. you're exposed to all of this. And, oh, yeah. There's something about being here in New York where you can come to an event, you can come to a podcast, you can come to a, a panel, you can go out yeah. to a, a gallery ex- exhibition, you can go to the Salt opening and all that, yeah. all that kind of stuff um, that 
is kind of hard to do anywhere else. Yeah, I tried to take full advantage of that. I've always felt like, you know, I if I can, I will. And uh, that and I cherish that. It's something I obviously miss in Guam, but I recently made friends with some local photographers there and they've invited me to their like hangouts. Oh, so nice. I'm finding my community. That's there. super cool. Yeah. Um, so um, let's go into a couple of these okay. photos here. So you've been doing a story on dogs. Oh, yeah. So I have to give you a little backstory. So while I was photographing my parents, I realized I needed to I needed to find another outlet you know like I had to focus on something else as well because it was my personal life and I always loved dogs and I think I think part of it was I found you know almost therapy in being around them and I I, yeah I talk to every dog on the street I see like I am a dog person through Mm -hmm. and through I like cats too fine but whatever um and so I started going to the Westminster dog show on assignment Mm -hmm. and it was hilarious. Oh I gosh. loved I've all I've been there the, once. It is so funny. Yeah, I've, I shot it six times. <laughs> and every time I met just such interesting people and interesting dogs. Yeah. Dogs of so... I know so many dogs, breed, breeds of dogs now. Like, I and I get excited when I recognize one on the street. Like, I just... It brought me joy. You yeah. could, like, see... It, like, just brought me joy. And I knew I needed that in the mix of all of this. I brought my parents, actually, to the dog show... Um, the year before my dad died and so they could experience some of that joy with me (laughs) right but then also i i i realized that um maybe what i needed to do is focus on a maybe find another project within this like maybe i could photograph family because that was something that i was familiar with but Mm -hmm. these dog families these people who commit their lives to a specific kind of dog um and obviously there's that little hint of like you know like people that you, you were attracted to a dog that maybe reminds you of you. and That's the story I did for a paper. Did you? Back, back then was uh, taking portraits of people with dogs that kind of looked like them. Yeah, well, and this was organic. These were, I, I wonder if these people like, oh, well, and it's more, it's more that like, I know that I'm attracted to certain dogs and I realize that I, they in person, look sometimes, but in personality are very, we're very similar. And so I, it, it makes, I think it's like any relationship, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I just found so much joy in, in the love and connection that people had. And maybe they don't even realize that they, that maybe they start to resemble the dog or the dog starts to resemble <laughs> yeah, them. Yeah, true. Um, but what was really special is that they're, this is not a community that's like eager to open up quickly to photographers because right. people do. They come maybe, in and come out. Yeah. They come in and come out. And um, so I was interested in, in maybe trying to tell some of their stories. Yeah. And, uh, and was this, was this self assigned stuff or was this something you were shooting? I, uh, well, it was sort of self assigned. I, I feel like all the papers and everyone had their shooters and I would con- I would talk to I was talking to Corbis and and I just needed to get credentials and then I wanted to I would give them I would shoot for them and give them photos and then I would shoot for me too like mm-hmm. I just needed to be there. Uh-huh. It was yeah. like harder it was hard to get in. Um I just found a lot of joy in being there and and and, and actually what ended up kind of coming from that was just spending, you know, I started reaching out to some of these people being like, Hey, like, here's a photograph I've took of you. Like would love to come to your house and like meet your dogs and see (laughs) your life. And I convinced a lot of people into it. Sure. And like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't, I hope that there's no judgment passed. Like I just want to understand what this relationship is like, because I'm in a place where I'm redefining what family means to me, you know, without my parents here. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's been, did you have a dog growing up? Oh, and we obviously had a dog growing up. For 17 were, years. There was a photo of your mom with a, a dog. In, in in the book? In the book. And there was an interesting story behind that, too. Wasn't there the, the dog that she didn't want to be touched? Oh, Moses. Moses, Well, yeah. actually, so Moses belongs to Stephanie Sinclair. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah I've met Moses. Yeah, okay, sure, yeah, yeah. And she had lent him to us because my mom was really, it was at the end of her life, and and my mom loved animals. We actually called the SPCA, the local SPCA, and requested to borrow, like, a basket of puppies, which, really? which they couldn't do, obviously, but we tried. Anyway, they probably so get she, that request once in a while. Don't I don't they? know. Do they? <laughs> there should be like a system in place. Anyway, um, uh, she offered to let us kind of take him as our own little therapy dog for uh, for a few weeks because mm. she she knew that we needed it, and he was great comic relief. And yeah, he lay, he would lay on her, and she didn't seem to mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, he brought us all joy, and he also brought us like the need, the the very much needed comic relief mm-hmm. and breath of fresh yeah. air because it was heavy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and going back to the the okay. Westminster folks and yeah. everything, and you talk about how I mean they this person 
who had this picture made probably spent a lot of money making this picture happen, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, obviously the horse isn't sitting at the table. Yes. I, can't, I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but, no. um, you know, they, they're really into their animals as their family. Yes, exactly. And that's what I found most. I found found it really interesting because, I, I mean, Cody was part of our family. She was in every family picture and every every everything mm-hmm. um she used to sign my birthday cards no oh, yeah uh <laughs> courtesy of my mother oh. um and, and i yeah and so and so you this is a, a separate story on, on the dogs yeah so this came i there was westminster and then through westminster i met these families that, like i call them dog families and right. in, invited myself in this woman um uh carol harris ha- is known for her whippets which mm-hmm. I didn't even know about Whippets. And so I invited myself into her home and she was very generous and welcomed me. And it, I have to tell you, I remember waking up the next morning and I looked out my door and there were eight little Whippet, like big Whippet heads just, or 16 Whippet eyes oh staring gosh. at me. Like, what's this? What's here? this? What are you doing here? Like, we want to come in. And <laughs> I, I got so, and it was totally therapy for me. Cause I remember I went outside and they all came outside and there were puppies and, it was pure joy. I have to admit, most of this project was because I wanted to roll around with puppies. Right. Well, hey, <laughs> you make things happen. That, that's the way you do it. You know, if you want to do it, you ask and you make it happen and you roll around with puppies and it's all good. Yeah, it's all part of the hustle. And I mean, this is actually what drew me down there. The friend who connected us said, oh, well, um, she'll like she'll give you a call. She's just like she's she'll give you a call tomorrow or something. Um, I just talked to her. She was like going to sleep. And was in bed with her eight dogs, and I, yeah. as a photographer, were like, was like, Need "Oh my god, that. I have to get yeah, there! I, I have to shoot that, right that. like immediately." So visual, um, yeah. It was just it, I really enjoyed. I think I also enjoyed using my energy in another way, shooting something that wasn't my family. It mm-hmm. kind of gave me a moment to breathe and a moment to think about other things and see other things and and exercise the muscle in a way that wasn't. I don't know. Sure. And then, and then we sort of move on to assignment work. regular, more regular assignment work because we started with the dogs and so yeah. on. But this is the more regular assignment work you've done for. Yeah, local. this was a yeah New York Times, Newsday, um, miscellaneous uh, magazines. And, and when you when you attend to get an assignment, is it usually the documentary sort? Or do you get do you ever get sent out for just portraits? What, what yeah, I, mean? I get portraits. I kind of I think because I've always said that I'm like I want to try everything. It's kind of. Ex- opened up the opportunities to do different things. Mm-hmm. Um, I also am very persistent. When I started working for Newsday, um, I had met the editor actually at, a, at an event at ICP and everyone was in line for the New York Times, but she had an empty seat and uh-huh. I went up to her and I obviously would have loved to meet with the New York Times, but I didn't have any real work to show them fresh out of school. and. You know, and I, they would never hire me. And sure. I realized they would never hire me if I hadn't really worked for a professional newspaper before. So I went and sat with the Newsday editor, Rebecca Cooney, who became a mentor of mine. And she gave me a chance. Um, one of my fun stories that I always share with students is that she asked if I had a car. And I said yes, which was a lie. <laughs> but I knew I could find a car if I needed one. Right. Um, and she gave me assignments. And and it was I would call every, I would call every day I say I'm available that was that's the way you got to do it when you start I yeah. mean I was exactly the same when I started here in New York I yeah. mean calling the desk say hey 7 a.m. just so you know yeah. I don't have anything on my schedule today yes so if something comes up you're I'm, on their mind you have to keep on their mind yeah and that go and that's something else I wanted to talk to you about was was networking and the importance of networking yeah both you know doing cold calls like like we were just talking about or social media because yeah. everyone's connected on social now yeah. editors of ours peers of ours and so on um how important has networking been for you and uh, also in terms of social networking have you been using that do you feel like it's been integral at all to you getting work or having your work seen yeah absolutely i mean what people sometimes forget especially photographers is that um Editors are, are normal people, too, and they use the Internet and they have their own lives and they, um, you know, they don't they want to be treated like normal people, too. And, and I, I guess like um, what I'm saying is that I, I have lots of editor friends and I consider them friends and it's I don't expect anything from them. Sure. And I, I I like to think that they don't feel like I'm just hanging around because I'm hoping they're going to give me an assignment. You know, right. like it's a small community. I think it's important to establish relationships and, and I networking. I mean, I've I've been networking since I was 
a tween, I love talking with strangers and getting to know people's stories and, and, and just connecting. And, um, and, and social media has been obviously very helpful. That, I mean, the Kickstarter was probably 40% of the backers were people I didn't know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and ultimately, when it came time to promote the book and promote the Kickstarter and all that, I was able to kind of talk with so many of the people that I met. Living in New York has been very helpful or had been really helpful because, you know, to become a familiar face was important, but also just to get my name out there. And, and there's a lot of opportunity here. Right. Um, but I think, I think sometimes social media can be overwhelming, but you can just, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. I know that when I was looking for subjects uh, recently, I posted something on Facebook and my network outside of photo, uh, everyone kind of commented like, oh, you should look this direction or you should talk to this person. It's so amazing. It's a, it is an amazing way. It's an amazing resource. Right. Um, sometimes overwhelming and I'm, and I'll admit sometimes I'll see someone's work and be like, and like I'm, there's like the tiny, I'm, I'm happy for them, but there's like a tiny bit of envy at times. Like it just, it kind it almost like pushes me to want to work harder. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it can, it's, it's great, but it can be complicated too. Uh, and it's just, we live in a, in a very special world with so many ways to communicate. Um, and and I think like I love doing that. I loved doing the hustle. I used to actually when I would call the newsday editor in the morning. I knew he got in at six. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, he got in at six fifteen. I would get up at six, clear my throat, walk around my room, you know, wake up, <laughs> and then I would call him because how unfair! He's already in the office, and I'm right. in my pajamas in bed calling <laughs> him from bed. Uh, and, but I also wanted to be ready, and you know, we like he didn't have assignments for me, and he didn't even know me. But I we chatted because nothing was going on. I uh -huh. think it's I think it's important to strategize I think it's important to be aware you know James Estrin saw my project because I submitted it to a contest and he was a judge mm -hmm. it did not win the contest but he it crossed his path and I think that's something to remember so that's something interesting you know a lot of photographers and, and I think maybe myself included I I've never been one that has really entered I, I get such anxiety yeah. I don't know what to choose oh yeah I, and then and then when it's happening I just get all this anxiety about it and yeah. I should have done this I should have done that regret and all that kind of stuff yeah and and so it's not just about this shows that because you entered it it didn't wasn't a winning entry no. but who but that I mean Jim has done a lot has done a lot has got the word out about your family project. just a little just a little just I a mean little. And, and James Estrin, for those that don't know, he's he's a New York Times staff photographer. He was one of my mentors when I interned there. He um, is also co-founder of the Lens Blog, which is an amazing you know photography blog that you all should check out. Yes. Daily updates of different photographers and and, and so on around the world. Um, so that that's incredible. Um, one last thing that I wanted to chat you and, and, and I can't remember exactly where we met, but I'm I'm thinking Eddie Adams Workshop. Maybe is it possible? I because I, I remember seeing you there. I, I feel was like a I, student there. I feel like I have a picture of you as a student, like slapping hands or something, or like but, sleeping in the corner, or something like that. <laughs> and, and I feel like that might have been the first time I, I I met you, but I'm not sure. It's that's the weird thing about New I York know. is that you see people everywhere, and yeah. it just all becomes you know. Well, and that's it's the weird thing, but it's also so special, and. It, that, I think that's what makes, I mean, like, that's what makes being in this industry so fun because you never know. I was scared to move to Guam because I knew that doors would close by leaving New York. I, I, I believed that doors would open when I got to Guam and they have, but to leave New York and to leave this like epicenter of work and edit like, and, and opportunity was scary. Um, but in our world today, like, I don't know where half my photographer friends are. Like it, there's a, the connectivity is what makes it amazing yeah. because I, you know, I recently, someone recently said you should mention in your like email signature that you live in Guam and that it's 14 hours of time difference because they're not going to know. It's true. And I was like, oh, that's right. Cause I'm up, you know, we're always connected. Right. Um, so it is possible to, to do these things, you know. And do you feel now that you've moved to Guam and you're, and you're trying to, you know, make a living as a photographer there, is it, is it more difficult to, are you, are you finding that? Oh, the New York Times is calling you for things there, or is there just not as much? Happening? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, nothing yet. Uh, <laughs> it's it's challenging. Um, 
it's it's more like challenging emotionally, like not getting those like getting those phone calls from the New York Times. Were, it was really validating. It was like, OK, I'm doing something right. And sure. like they want to work with me. And then like it's radio silence when I'm out in Guam. But I'm in contact with people yeah. and they're, you know, a lot of my the outlets I work for have been like, let us know if you have any interesting stories you want to pitch, yeah. which is actually kind of freeing. That's nice. And because I was gonna... now I don't I used to when I would when I rarely went to the gym because I couldn't make time for it. I uh -huh. would bring my gear bag. Because uh -huh. if they, if anyone called, I was oh, ready to go. I, I would not get, I would not do yoga. I, I would not do yoga. And you know how much you probably needed that yoga? Oh, yeah. And I remember the first time I did yoga, I was like, okay, I'm going to do one, one class with my wife. I'm going to put my phone, I can't bring your phone with you. I put it no. out. I missed a big job. That was, no. that I, you know, it's like I, they called 15 minutes after, before the class ended, and I, and it was a big one. It was uh. like a really, I forget uh. exactly what it was, but it was something I really regretted having missed. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's it. Boom. I'm not doing this yoga anymore or, or so well and and what's happening in guam is that you know what i i am in contact with people and things are in the works but you know when i'm awake ever like the u.s and europe they're asleep yeah um and so it gets a little quiet which has a freed me up and allowed me to take long dot take long walks with my dog and yeah. and start thinking about other projects and, and maybe even a little time to reflect on what all this experience has been about. You yeah. know, I've been, when I'm in New York, it, my memory is, you know, connected to this time in my life with my family. And by being in Guam, it kind of removes me and lets me look on from the outside a little bit, which maybe I, I also needed. Yeah. Well, Nancy, I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, and, and I see some a lot of people just sort of showed up. You guys missed some of the beginning of the of the project. We've got her book up here if you want to check it out, The Family Imprint. Um, again, this is available on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or your local bookstores. Um, and uh, please, uh, thanks again to Adorama, their event space. Thank you to uh, Canon Professional Services and Temba Bags, as always, for your support. Um, and Nancy, thanks to you. Is there, is there any, uh, we should also, your, your website is uh, nancyborowick.com. Yep. Social media. Nancy Borowick. Nancy Borowick. <laughs> um, and is there anything else that we've missed? Uh, any, any other little plugs that we want to send out into the internet world? Uh, I guess just, I don't know. This whole experience for me has reminded me the importance to, uh, the importance of, you know, talking with people and not being, my mom used to, can I read something from the book yes, real quick? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Here you go. So when we were cleaning out the house, my sister found these post-it notes. My mom, when she was dying, she um, she felt like she didn't have enough time to write us these letters that she wanted to write to us, these love letters. And I remember saying to her, you know, we know how much you love us. Like, don't fret. Uh -huh. um, but when we cleaned out the house, my sister found these three post-it notes. And it felt like she was kind of guiding us from beyond. And, and it was comforting to hear her words. So I'm quickly going to read her see words. see if you have that photo. Not in this edit. Okay. I was going to, and then I was like, all right, I didn't know how much time we had. So okay. this, is, this is impromptu right now. No problem. Um, so the three notes read, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's knowing that you are afraid and doing it anyway. Don't spend your days avoiding risk, being fearful. Act. Live your life on your own terms. Life is precious. Spend it without regrets in your own precious voice. For my three angels... If you want to talk or feel my love, look up in the night sky. I'm always watching over you. So I'm like, okay, like <laughs> act, live your life. Like, don't be fearful. You know, life is short. I don't know. It's, we, it's really easy to get wrapped up in all the stuff that's going on in the world. And, and it's important, but it's also important to, to kind of take a moment and smell the roses, you know, like, and, and just step back and, and appreciate what you do have. And hug people that you love. Nancy, you're amazing. <laughs> you're amazing. You're amazing, Robert. Thanks again for being on. And we'll see Thanks you all. Me. We'll see you all again next time. Take care, everyone. <laughs>